you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how you guys doing today? It's Anthony Gamgee. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. I, I actually, I'm watching the Zoom stuff. So during the intro, I actually saw it go to Russ and then back to me. So obviously everybody knows Russ is on the show today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so guys, this is going to be a great dialogue. We actually have uh, three guests plus myself. We're going to be uh, talking about working with your partner. Uh, a lot of us do have, you know, working units. We do have a partner. And I think the dialogue today is, going to be to maintain a good working relationship with the people that we're next to for eight to 16 hours a day. And uh, I definitely got some good experience sitting in this room with us because I'm sure each one of them at one point in their career has partnered up with somebody. So, uh, well, first, since Zoom did it already, let's introduce you to our guest speakers today. Russ Hamilton. Russ, Housekeepers of Chaos. We're coming up on that 5,000 mark. Uh you know, just looking, if you guys out there haven't heard of Keepers of Chaos or have wondered what we are, Keepers of Chaos is a site for corrections professionals, and we put forward uh, content, training, knowledge, and history of all different sorts, and it's a great fellowship there, and the, eff the emphasis is on the professional side of corrections, meaning that we're there to discuss what corrections is, what corrections does, and how we can move it forward in the future. Right. And, and, and obviously, I don't know if you guys ever got a chance to go on Facebook, but on Keepers of Chaos, Russ does have a mentor program there, uh, which is, I think is really good. Uh, I mean, a lot of people never really get a chance to interact with the correction professional before they enter the field. So I think this is a great opportunity for them to do so. I mean, I know I never had that opportunity. So I think that, I mean, when I saw that, Russ, I just think that's something that no other group that I know of is offering. So uh, I hope that, uh, that mentoring still continues to go. I, 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 I'm a big fan of that, Russ. I really am. Uh, we also have author Gary York is back. Uh, author and YouTuber, I'm sorry, fellow influencer. Gary, what's up, man? I'm doing a few projects. I'm writing articles for a couple of uh, correctional uh, folks, correctional agencies, correctional groups. Uh, I'm still doing my YouTube. And uh, my books are eight years old and five years old, but I, they're still selling. I was number seven this month with one and number 60 with the other. So, you know, uh, I'll tell you what, if you, if you get a book out, uh, you can let that thing run for about 10, 15 years if you keep, keep it in the right places. And I know your book is out, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. I just did a, a review for you after reading the book. So uh, congratulations on that, Anthony. The book is very good, and my review should be popping up on Amazon soon. Well, I'm honored, Gary, that you took the time to read it. Guys, Gary's got two great books, uh, Inside the Inner Circle, Corruption Behind Bars. Corruption Behind Bars being the first. Uh, Inside the Inner Circle, I believe, is the second. And then he does have a YouTube channel, True Prison Stories, Gary York. Uh, very good, very informative uh, channel definitely uh, covers on a lot of topics if you're interested in the corrections profession, even if you're looking from the outside, wanting to know what's going on. It, it's, it's a very good channel that really does provide a perspective that you're not going to get anywhere else. And Gary, thank you for reading my book. He's right. I do have a book on the market. I forgot. It made manipulation decoded. The link will be in the description. And I'm working on a book on correctional leadership right now. And uh, um, it's a little personal, so I'm having some fun with it. So it's going to take some time. But uh uh, I want to share some experiences I've never shared before. Now, Andy, Andy, the up and comer. I'm very excited. 2021 is going to be a big year for Andy. And uh, I'm, I can't wait to share the news, but we can't share it just yet. But Andy, what's going on, man? Not a whole lot. Glad to be back on the show, guys. Hey, guys, I'm Andy Abney Brotz coming to you from Indiana. Um, Gary, it's glad I'm I'm glad to have you on the show because I just bought your book, Corruption Behind Bars, tonight. So I can't wait to start reading that, dude. I'm um, still waiting on Anthony's book. And Russ, I'm a I'm an avid member of Keepers of Chaos. You know, keep up the great work. It, it's an awesome. So honored to be a part of this panel tonight. You guys have a lot of experience that I learn from every time I hear you guys talk. So just thanks for having me on again. You know what I love by, about Andy is Andy takes his time to talk about us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some time just talking about Andy. 
Andy is a true professional in the field. Uh, right now, he is hopefully going to get a nice position in something where he can influence some change because he's totally about the front line and their needs. Uh, him being in management, he understands the dynamics, but he really does keep his heart and mind on that front line. And what I can't give too much, but what he's coming up with doing, something that he's doing now, is definitely going to be something that we need, something that kind of facilitates good communication. And if you have a question about this profession and you don't know where to go, we may have a resource for you. That's the key. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that a lot. So, Andy, let me just thank you, you know, because you do a lot for this profession as well, including recognizing us small time individuals. So well, we, we love you, man. <laughs> I don't know about small time, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> now, guys, if you haven't the show, Chair Talk to you, brave men and women that work in correction. So please. Subscribe, interact, engage, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about maintaining a good relationship between your partner. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. All right, then we're back. So, so real quick, there's going to be a lot of positions where you're going to have a partner. You know, there's nothing you could do about it. The post itself requires a partner. Uh, hopefully, you're not working at these understaffed facilities, which are removing those partners when they shouldn't because policy says you need to. Um, but with that said, just to kind of give you an understanding of what type of post have a partner, I thought Russ could maybe, you know, give us some posts that would require a partner. Yeah, you know, when we tend to think of partners, um, a lot of times um, those are the situations that you are in where maybe you are over a dorm or you're over a specific housing unit. Um, and a lot of uh, facilities that I worked in, sometimes uh, you would end up having, you know, multiple partners because sometimes, you know, um, you would be in a housing unit. Like I've been in housing units where sometimes we had, you know, 15 to 20 people actually working in a single housing unit. Um, anytime that you're in a situation where you have to go out and count inmates, you're almost always going to have a partner with you. And uh, anytime that you're, you're actively patrolling areas of interest, um, like a yard or something like that, often you'll have a partner with you. And I want to take this specific instance just to um, give a quick shout out to my best longtime partner ever, Kenny Gonzalez. Uh, that's a guy that uh, spurred me on to uh, really, you know, higher and higher heights all the time because he was the one that was always back there saying that I could do it. I could impact in a certain way. And he really had a much bigger impact on me than he probably ever knows. Um, and, you know, he's the best partner I could ever hope to ever work with. Right. And I also want to add, uh, there are also sometimes partners that you may not work with daily, but you still are part of that same housing unit. So uh, let's say I have a bid and my housing unit is this specific unit, this eight hours. Well, then I would also assume that partner in that housing unit would be the earlier shift and the later shift, because together we want to have some consistency because ultimately we're working in the same house. Um, but Gary, when it comes to working with, uh, you know, a partner, uh, what are some of the things that you look for as an officer? Well, Unfortunately, in the in the Florida prison system, you're working alone a lot of times in a dorm. Um, but we did have partners in certain areas. Now, when I went to work for the sheriff's office, we always had a partner. You were always with someone on, on the shift. So when I had a partner that worked with me, I was looking for someone that was kind of a mover and a shaker. You know, we, we want to work together. We want to... Uh, share the work when it's count time, you know, let's get the count done together. In other words, I don't, I don't want to slacker with me. You know, our good friend, uh, Brian Boggs, who's a fan of all of us here, you, you guys know Brian Boggs. He told me that the, one of the worst things he, he hates is being put on shift with a slacker. And I think we all like feel the same because a slacker 
we'll try to drag you down. You know, oh, let's don't do this round. You know, we can skip this round. Well, no, I'm going to go do the round. You can skip it if you want. And you end up, if you're working with a slacker, you end up in a position where you find yourself doing all the counts, doing all the rounds, doing things that he should be sharing with you, you know, getting the caustics out for the inmates to clean up the pod, the jail pod. You seem to be doing everything. So when you have a, a good partner that you can rely on, I had a partner, a permanent partner for six months at the jail. We learned each other's movements and we worked together really well and we backed each other up. You know, you didn't, ha you don't want a partner when you're telling the inmates to do something that they can run over to that partner and say, well, he wants us to do this, but I know you, you, you don't mind if we don't do it. You know, if, if my partner tells an inmate to do something and the inmate runs to me, I'm going to say, if he told you to do it, then do it. You want a partner that will back you up, that will work with you, not against you. And you don't want a slacker because a slacker puts you in a tough position. You either have to say, okay, what do I do now with this slacker? If I run to the sergeant and say, sergeant, you got to get me somebody else. This guy is a slacker. Um, then what? You're just shooting the problem over to another uh, jail pod for some other officer. So sometimes you just have to approach those slackers and say, look, we need to work as a team. And when I had a good team member for six months in the jail, he knew what I was going to do. I knew what he was going to do. And the inmates realized, wait a minute, I can't play either one of these guys against each other. They're a team. They back each other. And see, inmates watch for that. Are, 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 are my partner and I backing each other? Or is one partner weak and, and they can play us against each other? So I want a good, strong partner, not a slacker. Yeah, and, and I, I love what Gary's saying, because if you think about it, he's talking about consistency. You know, uh, when I, I, I talked about sometimes you're going to have, uh, you know, different shifts, uh, different shifts running a house and you want to be consistent, which means that when I leave the shift and the next shift comes in, there's some consistency. If I if I write up an inmate on second shift, but for some reason there's no chance for that, maybe it's a simple discipline to be carried out in the house. I know for a fact that when I leave second shift, maybe that other officer is going to make sure that that discipline gets carried out, whether it's extra duty or, you know, locking the inmate into their cell for four hours, or when there's no consistency, the sad thing is, is that I may write up an inmate uh, and then wind up having to wait the next day until I'm there to enforce the discipline because I don't trust my partner on the, on the shift prior or the shift after to do what's expected. So I love that Gary says consistency because consistency leads to the inmates can't shop for staff either. You know, it, it's like imagine if your parents and, and mommy and daddy aren't talking and kids go to mommy, she says no and goes to daddy. And because daddy's not communicating with mommy, daddy says yes. No different here. You know, if you have partners that are consistent with each other, the inmates are only going to try that once. But like Gary said, once it's shown that, hey, no, we're a team. What did my partner say? That's it. The inmates are going to stop playing that game because they know that a no from, let's say, Gandy is also a no from Gary. So, so I'm sure, Andrew, that, that what, what Gary was touching on is, is really it's that consistency, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I really like what Gary said about when you were assigned to a pod or a unit that you didn't want a slacker. And I'm totally 100 percent with that because, you know, a I was the type of officer and still am that want to go out and find the contraband. You know, I want to go out <clears throat> see what the inmates are doing, but I also want to be the officer that my partner understands whoever is working with me that I want to give the inmate a no. So if an inmate approaches my partner on a round and says, well, Hey, Andy says, yes, I could have this stuff hanging up in my cell. Then the officer's going to say, no, you're full of BS because I know that he's all about the no. Um, so, yes, you know, need to be on the same page. Consistency is definitely key. Uh, you really need to know what your partner's doing, um, regardless of what's happening. A, for safety and security, but B, just for communication purposes. Like you had said before, you know, you want to make sure that the inmates aren't walking over your partner and that they understand what you're all about as well. Yeah, I want to explore a little bit more at the slacker real quick, and then I have another spot I want to go to because, 
Slackers for me, and, and maybe Russ can compliment when I'm done, is I want to have trust in my partner, right? So obviously, maybe we build a routine, especially, you know, if we're working next to each other. I mean, even sometimes between shifts, but, but definitely we're working next to each other, where I know that I'm comfortable that, you know, you're doing what's supposed to be done 100%, whether maybe today um, monitoring the unit while you're doing your searches or vice versa. But I know for a fact that, you know, you're not a slacker. You're giving it 100%. And that kind of, you know, I'm okay with that. But when I start to realize that you're not doing it 100%, yeah, I'm probably going to address you. Um, hopefully, eventually, if you're still not doing the job, and I, I may have to go to the supervisor. But in the meantime, because I can't trust you, I wind up getting overburdened with the work. You know, I mean, until it gets straightened out, until a supervisor is able to do something about that, you know, I still got this unit to run. I still got to maintain that safety and security. So what happens here is now maybe I start doing the searches all the time. Maybe instead of my partner who should do it once in a while, you know, he's a slacker. I don't trust him doing it. I start doing it. You know, so you wind up picking up the slack from the other individual. And now what happens here is you're doing double the work and then you're getting burned out a lot quicker. And, and, and Russ, I know you, you're that, you're that go get them person when you're, when you're dealing with a slacker and then, you know, it's like you're running to something then you turn left and right and where's my partner? I was always in the position where I always wanted to be the one who was out there and on the hunt, doing the proactive stuff. Um, the way I like to put it back then is, is you know, what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to fight crime, suppress evil and strike fear and terror into the hearts of inmates all over this unit. And so uh, for me, it was always about being on the lookout. What are we doing today? The same thing we do every day. We're looking for felonies. And so, uh, you know, to have someone that's slowing me down, to have someone that I'm not quite sure whether or not I can trust them to have my back in a sticky situation, because I'm going to have a sticky situation sometime during that shift, um, is just, you know, it's counterproductive. And, um, you know, it impinges the safety and security just not negatively that shift, but every shift afterwards. Um, the thing that I like to do is, is if I had that person that was a slacker, especially uh, being in that, uh, you know, that senior position where I had the trust of my sergeant or of my lieutenant or whatever, that person is going to be the person that's going to be having to learn from me during that shift. I'm going to be the one that's going to be taking lead, but I'm also the one that's going to be dictating, you know, what it is that we're doing. And so um, if they do want to learn from me so much, the better. If they don't want to learn, then um, everything that happens from that point forward, then they're going to have to back clean up. And, so, um, you know, the way that we run correctional institutions should always be modeled on that proactive uh, model, because there's no way that you can do enough in a situation where you might be taken hostage, you might be killed, you might be assaulted, all these other things. If you're out there day in and day out and you're preempting and preventing violence and other felonies from occurring, you'll always be in a much better chance to deal with it when something does happen. Also, just to, just in general, too, when I don't like fire starters. OK, so uh, I used to have a flow. Um, I used to come in and pretty much I, I didn't look to rile the inmates up. I did what was expected. Try to keep the day smooth. Sometimes you could work with a partner that just is ultra aggressive. What I mean is it's, it's everything is, is seems to be a conflict. And in the end, sometimes we just want to have that smooth day. So for me, working with those fire starters were a little tough to handle. I don't know, Gary, uh, have you ever dealt with those, what we call fire starters? Yes. Um, a fire starter. Now the, the inmates like to call them RoboCop. You know, you'll hear the inmates say, Oh, RoboCop's on tonight. Well, can, can that nickname RoboCop be good or bad? It, it could be both, but I'll tell you what, um, it makes it hard when you have a fire starter working with you. Because if you have a fire starter as a partner, they may not have the best communication skills, interpersonal communication skills. Everything with them is get your ass up, kick the bed maybe, you know, I've seen, I've seen officers, you know, uh, kick the side of the bunk or do this or that. You know, instead of de-escalating, they seem to escalate everything up. And, you know, when you have a partner like that, I used to just think, oh, my God, this is going to be a rough night. Because we're going to have issues that come up on the shift normally without any extra agitation, I call it. So when you have a partner who likes to agitate, 
Now, there's a difference between being a go-getter, searching cells, looking for contraband, then there is, that's a, there's a difference doing your job that way than being an agitator. And an agitator can start a fire quick and get an officer hurt quick. I've seen uh, inmates that were not going to get physical, not going to get physical. And the officer continues to follow them and verbalize. And, you know, not that the inmate, the inmate's not disobeying anything, not uh, doing, doing what the officer says, but the officer just wants more and more and more until the inmate goes off. Now, why make the job harder? Why put yourself in that position? We have inmates who are going to go off anyway. So that's going to happen, you know, anyway. Don't agitate and don't start fires. It really makes it for a rough night and it makes it rough on your partner because you got to back your partner up. So once they start that fire, guess who's in the fire with them? You're in the fire with them. You're taking that inmate down and maybe other inmates jump in. You're, you're right in the fire. And then you have to regroup when it's all over and take that guy to the corner and say, look, you know, that probably didn't have to happen, but that's between you and me. I'm not going to talk to my, to the supervisor. I'm just talking to you man to man, you know, that shouldn't have happened or man to woman, whoever your partner is. And that's just my opinion on fire starters. I don't like working with a fire starter. Right. And you, I don't know if people realize fire store, fire starters have the ability to unite the population uh, from the admin level. You could see like you have this one officer who's kind of like a rogue. And let's say that, you know, the, everywhere the officer works, they get these abundant amounts of complaints. You know, that's a big concern for us because that officer is putting themselves at risk, but also putting their partners at risk. And sometimes when they feel that administration hasn't done enough, then they're going to try to take measures into their own hands. And sad thing is, that's when the wrong person gets hurt. Because once the plan's in motion, you know, it's about a statement. Well, okay, well, that fire starter wasn't in work today, but guess what? Ganji is, and we're going to have to, hey, Ganji, this wasn't meant for you. Now we're going to get you. So those fire starters, they really do, uh, they're, they're definitely a problem for safety and security because, as I said, in the end, um, the inmates are going to try to voice their concern the right way. And then when they feel that the actions aren't being done, so let's say I'm administration and I give the uh, investigation over to a supervisor and their supervisor is not doing the investigation correctly, you know, the inmates are still going to be like, yo, nothing's being done. And eventually, we am not saying it's the right thing for the inmates to do, but we also haven't stepped up to do the right thing. Uh, is they start taking measures into their own hands. And sometimes it's just really going to those officers and, hey, let me tell you, you know, what you're doing wrong. And if you don't correct yourself, I'm going to tell you why you're going to continue to be a risk. And eventually, you know what's funny too, guys? I've noticed with fire starters too, you're, they're going to get policed by their own officers. They're going to get policed by the peers. Because like you said, I don't want to get caught up in your bullshit. So most likely the peers are going to sit them down and, kind of give them that once over and it's going to be an aggressive once over from the peers. Hey, Andy, what's your thoughts on those fire starters? Yeah. And, you know, just like you said, you, you hope that their peers would pull them aside and say, you know, this is not the right way to go. And I like to kind of think of a fire starter as a bully on a playground. You know, they go around, they push people's buttons, they start pushing people and they're going to eventually push on the wrong person to get themselves hurt. Number one. Uh, but just like Gary said, in rest, you know, they're going to they're going to really piss off the wrong person and they might, you know, wait, lie in wait for the other officer to come through the other officer that's doing their job. So, you know, as an admin <clears throat> or as a first line supervisor as well, you really want to identify who those people are and, you know, whether it's a training issue or what it might be, but you really got to rein them in or corrections might not be for them, but they're going to eventually either get themselves hurt or get somebody else hurt. Hey, Russ, you have anything about fire stars? Have you ever worked with a partner that just kind of rouse things up? Yeah, you know, those, um, those tend to be the officers that are pretty one-dimensional. They know how to do one thing, and they think that they do it well, but what they're really doing is, is they're just creating, you know, extra work and, uh, you know, extra jeopardy for everyone. Um, when you're in corrections, when you become, you know, that competent, consummate professional, what's happening is, is you're able to meet the moment at the level that it's intended to be met at. 
there is a time and a place to be hard as nails, tough as nails, and to be no nonsense and, you know, completely ready to go hands on. There's also a time and a place for giving an inmate a break. There's also a time and a place to be helpful to the inmate population, to give them some information on something that they need or to make sure that, you know, they have uh, what they need for work or whatever it is. You know, that's the service part of it. Um, some of these officers, though, they're unable to learn that um, that, that particular so-called talent that they have isn't meant for everything all the time, 24-7, 365. And so you have to be adaptable, you have to be flexible, and you have to be able to select the right hat to wear at that moment in time. Yeah, you know what's funny, guys? Uh, just speaking of the grievance system, you know, majority of the complaints are probably going to be bogus, we know that, but you have to treat them all as if they're real, because once in a while... There are some real ones that have to be addressed. And it's crazy when, you know, you get the people that, uh, you know, send out the uh, investigations on the grievances and they pretty much don't expect, you know, a supervisor to come back and say that there is a concern. They expect it to be, you know, you know, just talk to the officer, talk to the inmate and, you know, squash it. Sometimes it can't be squashed because the, the officer may not listen. You know, sometimes, um, uh, you know, I, I remember instances where you had inmates making complaints about an officer going out of their area into another area. So, of course, you know, you address it. You even catch the officer in that area. It's like, hey, can you tell me why you're here? You know, what's going on? And then the moment you go to bring it to your supervisor, supervisor's like, okay, so is the handle resolved? I don't know, you know, because this officer right now still finds himself, you know, in that area where he shouldn't be. So are you taking the word of the inmate or the officer? I'm, I'm telling you what I see. You know, so I'll tell the officer, hey, do me a favor. You know, there's no reason to be down here. Next time you're down here, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to write you. Because at the end, you're starting to get complaints and you really don't have a reason to be in this area. And then the problem is, and here's the funny thing, it's when the complaints come from the inmates and they start, you know, making it, you know, let's say to management, we become responsible for that. You know, especially with the JPay system, our actions to the inmates complaints are recorded in a system. So if you keep on getting the same complaint over and over and over again, and there's no solid action, if something does happen, God forbid, let's say, you know, the inmate does assault the officer or the officer, you know, goes after you, whatever the case may be, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go back to management. They're going to say, does the inmate ever put a complaint on that officer before? Is there a history on that? And all of a sudden, you get all these JPEGs that say, oh, yeah, concern was addressed. Concern was addressed. Concern was addressed. You know, it, how was it addressed? You know, was the officer ever pulled from their post? You know, they look for action. So the, the key here is, guys, is that, yes, you're going to get some bogus complaints. But in the end, there are going to be some real ones. So each, one's have, each, each complaint has to be taken seriously because if it's not, there's a liability there. The other thing I want to mention, too, is officers that play favorites. Um, I've seen that, too, where actually, to me, it becomes very uncomfortable. You know, so especially, you know, when you're, you know, you're a male officer working in a female jail and you see that same female out all the time dealing with that same male officer. It's like, hey, listen, um, why is this person out at this time? Oh, they're just cleaning. Yeah, but there's no one else out. So it doesn't need to be cleaning right now. I mean... I mean, I mean, Gary, have you ever had that, Gary, where you're working with a partner and it seems like they're kind of playing favorites with an inmate? Yes, it's funny um, you brought that up. Now, of course, when I did investigations in the prison system, uh, we would get witness statements from people. And, you know, you gather evidence and and a lot of officers would sometimes write a sworn affidavit on a male's improper activity with female inmates or a. Um, uh, a female's improper activity with male inmates. So, but I was working in the jail and I would come in and relieve a shift. And when I would relieve the shift, the um, same female officer was always talking up in the corner, up in the cell to an inmate in his cell. So I waited till after the shift change was done and our count was done. And when we got all settled, I told my partner, I said, I'm going to go up there and search that cell, keep an eye. 
And I went up and searched the cell and um, found uh, some brand new cigars, five cigars, brand new, unopened, and some cologne. Well, of course, I, I wrote an instant report and I took the evidence and, and tagged it and bagged it and turned it in and it went up the line and, and they did what they had to do from then on. Because remember, I wasn't an inspector anymore. I had gone from the prison system to the jail system. And, you know, something just told me this, this female officer spending way too much time with this inmate. And, uh, and I went and searched the cell and that's what I found. Um, now, I'm sorry to say that uh, I never heard another word of it. And when I asked uh, supervision what happened, they said they don't know. You know, if that would have happened in the state, we would have turned that over to either the institutional inspector or the regional inspector, and we would have done an investigation. Um, I hate to think that we let one slip away there. Yeah, you, you know what? But, but can I tell you something? We are responsible to police our own, you know, uh, Sometimes I think, guys, this is actually a great uh, tip from Gary, too. If if you notice that, you know, like, let's say my partner is a little too close. Maybe we search that area or drop an anonymous note to your supervisor to request that area uh, be searched. Because, again, that closeness is definitely a threat to the facility. Uh, I'm sure you, you may you ever get that, uh, Andy, a lot where you have uh, certain officers playing favorites and just kind of. You got to kind of have to sit them down and, and, and tell them what that looks like, especially to the rest of staff. Yeah, most definitely, you know, and that can really be a detriment to not just your shift, but to the entire operation. And first you talked about grievances, you know, let's go back and talk about that for a second. Grievances, in my opinion, are a barometer to your facility. I'm sure Gary can attest to that when it comes to investigation side you learn a lot from grievances and just my experience as jail admin, you know, you find dirty staff members from inmate grievances and, you know, you've got a unit full of 30 inmates. You've got one officer doing something for one. You've got 29 other inmates that are wanting that same thing. And when they don't get it, what are they going to do? They're going to write a grievance. They're going to talk about it. So I, I found that to be uh, a positive tool to use. Uh, but when it comes to officers playing favorites, <clears throat> really want to keep an eye on those. And other officers, it makes it hard on them because the inmates will come to you and say, well, so-and-so is doing this. And that, you know, we all know that's a part of inmate manipulation for sure. Uh, when, when in fact, are they doing it or are they not? Um, I have heard of a staff member in the past, not necessarily at my facility, um, who would change her hair color and this is why it's important to stay on top of uh, your dress code. But depending on the hair color of the female would indicate whether she was bringing contraband that day to particular inmates or not. And to come to find out that that, that particular uh, officer was one that would play favorites with, with, with the inmates. So it's a good indicator. I'm sure Gary can attest. Um, when you've got people that are getting close to the inmate population, it could be the first step in them getting manipulated, or they could be way past that stair number six. So definitely got to rein those in um, and identify what is going on there. Hey, Gary, I'm, I'm looking at your response to the hair color thing. Uh, what's up with that, Gary? I never heard of that. Yes, um, I love the way he uh, gave that example because we had one that – her, if her hair was up, everything was fine and kosher. We learned this, of course, after the investigation was over. And if she put her hair down, now, you know, I know there's rules and regulations on the hair, but if she put her hair down, that was an indicator to the inmate. So it, it's almost along the same line as he just described. Remember, these officers that are bringing contraband in, they're going to have all these codes with the inmates. They're going to have little secret codes that they figure you and I, we're just not going to pay attention to that. Is her hair up in a bun or did she put it down? Uh, did she take the bun out today? Uh, is her hair blonde or did she put red streaks in it? You know, uh, all these are little signs and, and code words they use with each other. Yeah. I kind of never heard that before. That's, that's, Hey, you learn something new every day. Uh, I, I also want to mention also when, when, and I know maybe Russ could help me out with this is that, when obviously when you work with that officer that isn't being fair and, and, and consistent, 
Uh, then what happens here is one thing is, is that me being on the other side, the other inmates are going to pick up on that. They're probably going to start coming to me, by the way. The, yeah, you know, the other, so, the, you know, they're going to expect something from you anyway. So right now that, that officer's actions are affecting me. And the other thing is, is now I'm looking at that officer. It's not about me and him being consistent with each other because that's not happening. But he's also not being consistent or she's not also being consistent with themselves. You know, because every time this one inmate comes out, this one inmate gets to live a little. And 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 I think and and um, hey, Rush, just out of curiosity, man, have you ever dealt with someone that kind of seems to wave on the rules depending on who they're dealing with? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, you can look back over a career, and you know, have several of those particular instances that you can delve into. Uh, we had uh, one officer who retired, and then within a few weeks after her retirement, suddenly she was showing up, and she'd been giving favoritism to this inmate, and no one thought anything of it, and suddenly she's on his visitors list. I mean, what does that tell you? I know, I, I see Gary there. He's, he's seen that before. He's probably seen it several times. And so, um, you know, you have to pick up on some of this uh, particular behavior that people have. And sometimes all you can do is watch it. Sometimes what you have to do, um, because, you know, duty demands that you take some sort of action. In some circumstances, you have to report it. Um, I had an incident that, that happened with me when I was in uh, as a culinary sergeant one time. We just kept noticing that this one female cook was just, you know, a little bit overly familiar with this one particular inmate. And it was every day. And so uh, I called up this inmate's unit and I had the officers there go hit his house. And he had multiple bundles of marijuana there. Well, the next thing that they were able to do and take out of that uh, uh, particular locker, fortunately, because I had some very good searching uh, officers, they were able to recover an envelope that had a local postmark on it. And that local postmark led straight back to her. And so it wasn't, it wasn't too far of a jump. But these are the kinds of things that we have to fight and we have to be on guard for all the time. Um, it's, it's never ending. I mean, it's eternal vigilance on our part in order to keep ourselves safe and to you know, further pro the profession. I don't want anyone to look down on correctional officers. I don't want anyone to say, oh, they're all dirty because we're all not. But that minor little portion of them, those are the ones that we have to be on guard against and those are the ones that we have to out at any cost. So it's not about snitching or anything like that. It's upholding that duty. You sat there, you swore, you took an oath. Damn well better live up to that oath, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something. Throughout my career, most of the time I've always worked with good partners. I think that when you're professional, um, at least when they're around you, they up their game. Um, you know, again, but you have to stay committed to what you need to do and the job that you have to get done. But if you start to slack, then if you do have a partner that is slacking as well, that's going to encourage them. So obviously one of the advices here I would give is always keep that professionalism in the hopes that the other person says, you know what, if I'm going to mess around, I can't do it today because I'm working with Russ or I'm working with Gary or I'm working with Andy or Ganji because they're on point, you know, they're doing their job. Um, before we come to a close, there's also one other thing I want to mention, because obviously, we, you know, you can work for par work with partners in, in many different locations. But I want to talk about just just the benefit here. I, I think kind of like an overall um, what to do uh, to maintain that good relationship is communication. I mean, I know people kind of throw it out generally nowadays, communication, communication, communication. But it is communication. Uh, communication is what keeps things consistent but also don't be afraid to tell your partner because remember guys we're here to help each other we have to trust each other so so if i have a concern and i'm coming to you with a concern it's because i have a concern it's not because i'm trying to challenge you in any way sense or form or trying to say that you're dirty or you know don't be resist i'm i'm your partner and these are my concerns and the funny thing is is sometimes People decide not to address the concerns because they're concerned about breaking the, you know, oh, what if I'm wrong? And, uh, you know, now we don't have that bond anymore. And 
you know, you're so concerned about that, but what if you're right and you don't do something? So, you know, what's the lesser of the two evils, you know? Now, if you're wrong, your partner understands the, the why you're doing it, though. It, there's good intent behind there. You know, it's like, hey, I'm, I just want to make sure you're good, that, you know, we're good together, you know, and, you know, trying to reinforce what needs to be done so both can be effective. But, but in the end, if you're afraid that, by saying something, I'm going to hurt this person's feelings. That's why a lot of corruption ha happens. Because a lot of the times when people get caught up and do foolish shit, you'll have people that will come up and say, I knew that was going to happen. Well, if you knew it, why didn't you do anything? Well, why? Why, why, why? So you knew it was happening, but you chose not to do something. Well, it was just a gut feeling. Would you be so willing to say it was just a gut feeling that you had if the end result was a knife in your partner's back? Would you have been so quick to say, oh, because a lot of us are so quick to say, I knew that was happening. I knew that officer and they were having sex. And, you know, I wonder if that would be the same result if, you know, a knife found its way to kill me. Would you be so quick to say, well, I knew that was going to happen. I, 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 I knew that that person was going to put a knife in your back. No, you know, we're so concerned that if we say something, we're wrong. But in the end, the, the, the worst outcome is if we don't say something and we're right. So have that communication, have that daily talk, build that trust with each other where, Hey, you know, we're here to police each other, but yet I'm afraid to tell you something. It, it doesn't make any sense. We can't live by the code that we're going to police each other, but then be afraid when we need to, you know, it, it, because we, believe it or not, man, everybody has their ways of policing and that's fine. But there are some people that they, they, they go a little too far in any aspect. And that's when we're supposed to be there to check it. And one thing we shouldn't be doing one thing that we shouldn't be doing is telling everybody else around that individual but the individual. You know? Oh, shoot. Uh, Ganji's coming. Shut up. No, Ganji's the one that's supposed to know. Ganji's the problem. So now we're in this centralized area. We're all chatting. But we all go hush-hush when Ganji comes in, who's probably doing, you know, something foolish. Or maybe he doesn't know he's doing something foolish. But in the end, all we do is separate ourselves from Ganji. So now Ganji's alone, and now Ganji has nobody but the inmates because no one's talking to Ganji. But Ganji has no idea why or not thinking he's doing anything wrong. So in the end, guys, man up, police each other. If you see that there's a concern, talk to the person. And if that doesn't resolve it but you still feel there's a concern, guys, safety of the facility, safety of your staff, go to your supervisor. Put it on someone. But, but I just want to ask this in general. Uh, and I guess we'll start with Russ first and work our way through. Um, a lot of people are afraid to tell their partner when they think they're doing something wrong. You know, and, and I think to me that fear uh, to, you know, tell my partner, hey, you can't be doing this is what puts our, our facilities at risk. What's your thoughts on, on that, Russ? Do you see that a lot? You know, ideally, the you know, your partner is someone that you have that ultimate trust in. And so um, if you have that ultimate trust in your partner, uh, they should be able to tell you anything. And you should be able to take that uh, information, that perception of theirs, and uh, act on it, explore it, um, fix what's wrong with you if necessary. And you ought to be able to do the same for them. So, um, you know, the idea that we're, you know, that we should be so much at odds with each other, which is the way that some people view this, um, is just wrong. Um, it's understandable from the viewpoint, though, that as corrections professionals, we're often prideful. But some of these people, um, we do need to rein in. And some of them, um, you know, some of them we may not be able to save. Uh, ultimately, though, I mean, I had so many good partners over the years, and those were people that I could count on with my life. And uh, there were many instances where they proved that, you know, time and time again. So, uh, you know what, be honest, be open with your partner, expect the same from them, uh, get on the same page together, figure out together how you can make an impact on your little area. You know, um, you change the world by, and, and the view of corrections and everything else by taking on, you know, one unit, one little area at a time. And when people see your success, then they want to emulate it. And when they emulate it, they make the entire institution better. And when they make that entire institution better, your whole department can become better for it. Or 
we can go that route where it's every man for themselves and we keep to ourselves and we don't put ourselves out there on the line and try and suggest what's right. We don't try and model those things that we know to be correct. And we just become, you know, that individual that just is kind of in it for the minute, you know, uh, ate and hit the gate. Yeah, and, and I, I know, Gary, you're in agreement with what Russ is saying, what I'm saying. I mean, obviously, I'm sure in your investigations, you come up with uh, people that, you know, could have done something about it, but they chose not to. And in my mind, they could be just as responsible then. Yes, uh, Russ is right on the money. And, you know, don't be a socialite with your partner's reputation. Now, what do I mean by a socialite? Well, socialites love to go talk and tell everybody everything that's happening in their dorm or their housing unit, except they're not talking to, as you described, Anthony, their partner. So in a way, you, you're not sure that your partner is wrong, but you, but you get an inkling they're wrong. If you run around and talk to everybody else about what's going on in your housing unit or dorm, you're really kind of gossiping and you're putting your partner's reputation on the line. How would you feel? I just ask officers that want to go talk about their partner. How would you feel if they, if your partner was running around the prison or the jail talking about you behind your back? So what I say is just what Russ said. And I know Andrew's uh, probably uh, going to agree with us. And what you said, go to your partner, not everybody else and straighten it out between you and your partner. Just to sum it up. Don't be a socialite with your partner's reputation. Yeah, I think you said a key. Straighten it out with your partner. Um, hey, hey, Andy, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I guess I mean it does turn out to be workplace gossip. Yeah, that's definitely not where you want to be. Um, you don't want to be labeled as somebody that can't be trusted. And that's what happens when you go around the problem and talk to everybody else about the problem first. And you lose your integrity. That's what we're trying to keep intact is our integrity as corrections officers. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to just man up, tell, tell your partner, look, I don't agree with what you're doing, or, you know, I'd like to see you do more. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, make this a productive shift. Definitely want to say something to your officer first. If that doesn't do any good, then definitely go up the chain of command because you don't want to get caught up in something that this officer may be or may not be potentially doing. Yeah. And again, just before we come to a close, it, it brings us right back to communication. It's great because as we discussed all these problems, that were happening, the key is communication and consistency. You know, if you feel at any moment there's a shift in consistency, try to go back to communication. If that doesn't work, then you're probably going to have to go to a higher level to report. So look for communication to bring consistency. If you lose consistency, try one more time at communication. It doesn't work, guys. You got to go up another level. And I will say this again, one more time is if, if you're a professional, and people know you're a professional, you can start to control the environment that's around you where others will step up their game, at least when you're there. And sometimes when people say, well, that person was dirty, you must have known it the whole time because you're his partner the whole time. Not if I'm a professional, though. If I'm a professional, they clean up their game around me. They step it up a little bit. So maybe I don't see it because they're not that way around me. But don't get me wrong, when you put two slackers together, that can be seen. You know, it's funny. Go to the slackers. If you want to find out, you know, what a slacker, uh, if you're looking, if you're investigating a slacker, go talk to another slacker. Because most likely together they slack off. And it's, I don't know if that's even a word, but it's true. You, 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 you're going to investigate a slacker by talking to the professionals. There may be a good chance that the professionals up the game of the slacker. But if you talk to a slacker about another slacker, there could be a chance that they kind of, that's their norm. They, they just, that's how they roll. Um, but again, you allow things to happen if you allow things to happen. So if you keep professional, if you run the unit the way it should be, what you'll wind up getting is, yeah, I'm working with Russ today. And here's the funny thing, guys. One more thing before we come to a close. I, I, something as I learned throughout my career was if you're a good officer, the one, the, the partners that don't want to work with you are questionable. Because you may get someone that will look at the schedule and say, man, I can't believe I got to work with Russ today. And then for those that know Russ as a professional, like, well, why would that be a problem? Like, why do you not want to work with Russ? 
You know, I, I don't understand why that would be a problem. Makes me want to think about, you know, and sometimes they slip and say that. Sometimes you may be at that, you know, with that, that line of trying to see who they're working with, see who they want to work with and who they don't want to work with. You know, especially if you know that person is a slacker. Oh, good. I get to work with Ganji today. Well, I guess Ganji is going to let the slacker do whatever they want. Or oh, I'm going to work with Russ today. You know, that shit. Damn, I can't believe work with Russ because Russ puts that person on point. You know, again, not, not outside of the extremes we talked about. I'm just talking about just in general. Um, hey, guys, everything you want to say in closing, Andy? I just want to say thanks again, Anthony, for having me on. It's been a pleasure with Gary, Russ, and you, Anthony, again. You know, I want to say to your listeners, Anthony, that, um, you know, Anthony's not doing this for his own good. He's doing this to get the word out. And that's ultimately what we are all doing as well. It's just getting the word out, making corrections professionals across the nation better at what we do and making us more aware. So I just want to hats off to everybody here and be safe. Yeah. And, and real quick, what I love about this guys is that, you know, Russ is coming off from work, Gary hard day, what he does, the farm, the, the family time and Andy hard day at work myself as well. But we come back here and we discuss work one more time just to make sure the information is out there. And uh, you know, that, that takes a lot on all ends to do that. It's a sacrifice of our time just to make sure that we're, giving something back to the profession because we love the people in the profession. And um, that's, that's noble in itself. Gary York, anything you want to say in closing, sir? Yes. I just want to tell everybody, thank you for your service. Please be safe and don't be a slacker and please keep care of everybody and watch each other's back. And Russ and Andrew, it was a pleasure talking with you guys tonight. And thank you very much to Anthony for having me on again. Always a pleasure, Gary. And guys, don't forget, Gary's got those books inside the inner circle, Corruption Behind Bars, Great Reads, Channel, True Prison Stories, Gary York. Don't forget to check it out on YouTube. Uh, hey, Russ, anything you want to say in closing, sir? Yes. Uh, guys and gals in corrections, go out there and be an inspiration to your partner. You know, have them be an inspiration to you. Feed off of each other. Um, you know, you can go out there and just be as good as what your sum is, or you can find that synergy. You can find that energy. You can find that going the extra mile. And when you get to that synergy, you know, one plus one is 10 after that point. You guys can be better together than you can ever be apart. And sometimes you have to find the right partner to do that with. So sometimes you don't have a chance, but whoever your partner is, try and be in that mental mindset where that's your goal to be, you know, on the same page with that person, to be out there, to be fighting the crime, to be, you know, doing what you have to do, to be that consummate professional corrections individual, all right? And as an individual, feed off of each other to be more than just the sum of that one and one. Oh, wow. <laughs> that you went, you went into algebra there. You know what I mean? That's, that's a book that made me cry. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, Again, guys, just, just remember, guys, communication's key. Communication brings consistency. Uh, and in the end, if you feel something, say something because you have experience. It's your gut speaking. I mean, we in corrections, we live by that experience. You know, it's it just yet we tend to ignore it sometimes when it probably matters the most. If you have to say something and you're afraid that you're, it's going to hurt your partner's feelings, that's on them. That's not on you. Eventually, if they don't come around, again, that's on them. That's not on you. But the moment we stop doing it, the moment we stop policing each other, you know, look, Gary's story, the moment we start finding contraband, you know, it's not about you being wrong. It's about you not doing something and being right. As always, guys, the show is here. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. Whoa.